Uh, and I just want to get straight into it, really, with Aidan Gomez, who is the CEO of Cohere, one of the uh, leading large language model AI firms uh, at the moment. Um, Aidan, just give, give us a very quick uh, line about what exactly Cohere does. Yeah, so I'm Aidan, one of the co-founders of Cohere. We build large language models uh, and focus on putting them in the hands of enterprises. So building a platform to adopt that's cloud agnostic and completely private. And how are you trying to compete with some of the other big large language model companies out there, the likes of OpenAI, uh, et cetera? What, what, how are you trying to dif differentiate? So we think independence is extremely important. Uh, so we're available on every single cloud platform, you know, Azure, GCP, OCI, AWS, mm -hmm. in addition to on-prem. So you're not getting locked into one stack, one cloud. The second piece is completely private deployments. So your data isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's staying in your environment. Uh, any model that's trained on it is yours. It becomes your IP, as opposed to potentially leaking out to other customers. Yeah. When you say independence, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, what I mean is we're not taking any massive behemoth checks from a single cloud provider that might lock us in uh, to one ecosystem, one environment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're really trying to be independent and, and build something new for the world. Mm. Yeah. And there's so much debate this week here at Davos around AI, the risks, uh, the potential unintended consequences, the way to develop uh, this technology responsibly. So I just want to get your thoughts on some of these areas. The first one is this debate that's going out uh, at the moment over whether AI presents a, a threat to humanity. The, the likes of Sam Altman and, and Elon Musk uh, take this view and regularly talk about it. Uh, there's the other si side that says, well, this is just completely overblown. I know you actually sent a memo around to the company recently talking about this idea of um, effective altruism, mm -hmm. uh, and you had some criticisms of that. Could you just sort of lay out your position in this debate um, and whether there's more nuance to it than just, you know, black and white? I, I, think, there, I think there is. I think maybe it's the boring take to take something in the middle. It's not going to wipe out humanity and, you know, Terminators and Skynet. Uh, it's also not, not a risk and yeah. something that we shouldn't think about at all and just not regulate, not touch. I, I think the reality is the technology is extremely powerful, mm -hmm. very general, it's horizontal. Language is you know, the one thing that humanity does that no other animal does. And so it can be used for a lot of powerful things that can hurt people. And so we do need regulation. We need thoughtful regulation that doesn't entrench value with the incumbents, make it difficult for startups and new innovation to emerge. Mm. But we need regulation within sectors. We need. Uh, regulation in healthcare, we have to empower the existing regulators to get smart with this new technology and they know their domain best. Yeah. We should be empowering them to think about what are the impacts of this technology in their specialized domain, as opposed to horizontal regulation which says AI is bad, we should slow it down, we should stop, which I think is A, impossible to do and B, actually really, really bad. AI holds the promise to alleviate productivity crises that we're facing, discover new drugs. We should really be pulling it you know, from the future forward yeah. as opposed to trying to slow it down and push so, it down. So you think a better way to approach it is more sort of industry-specific regulation around the technology rather than some sort of AI law, basically? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's <clears throat> almost impossible to effectively regulate mm. um, a horizontal technology. You can't regulate the computer. You yeah. can regulate the computer's applications into particular domains. Mm. Uh, the same thing is true of a general technology like AI. Um, with respect to the, the discourse and X risk, this idea of existential risk yeah. from AI and how it's played out, I do think there's somewhat of a doomsday cult emerging, uh, which is you know very swept up by stories of sci-fi. And, and it makes sense to me. I'm actually really empathetic to that position because since before computers, before the internet, certainly before AI, we've been you know, writing stories about our technology rising up and taking over us. Yeah. And so it's, it's deeply embedded in the cultural brainstem of humanity. Mm. And so it makes sense why people are scared of that. The default is fear. Yeah. The default for anything new, anything powerful, anything general is fear. I think that narrative is starting to shift, even among my peers like Sam Altman you mentioned, yeah. um, if you listen to what he was saying this week, mm. the, the narrative shifting is less about this is the end of the world, it's more about actually, I think this is going pretty well. I, I think we're gonna have a really good technology that people are gonna love and that it's gonna do a profound mm. amount of good. Is there, is there any, uh, why do you think sort of 
people like Sam Altman and, and Elon Musk, for example, have been, you know, as you, as you call it, a doomsday call. Why do you think they've been sort of talking about existential threats for so long? These are people developing the technology itself. Is there another agenda to it? Um, I, I wouldn't call those individuals part of a doomsday call. <laughs> and I, I would actually point to them as examples of folks who earlier in the technology's development were fearful and cautious and, and urging a great deal of caution, who as it has come to fruition, as it's actually gotten into the hands of the public and started to yeah. be deployed in production, have shifted towards a more optimistic, progressive uh, stance. I, I, I think there's a more academic posturing which is about the theoretical future, what could go wrong, the catastrophes. Um, that's the group that is more, I would say, bearish on AI. Mm. I, I guess also when people talk about these existential risks, they're not talking about some of the large language models we have today. They're talking about this idea of artificial general intelligence, right? Mm. This idea of, of this better than human level AI. Um, I think Sam Altman was talking this week about he, how he thinks it will be developed in, in the reasonably close-ish future. Um, what's your view on, on sort of artificial general intelligence and, and how that develops and, and when it comes to fruition? Yeah, I mean, for first off, AGI is like a super vaguely defined term. If we just, you know, term it as better than humans at pretty much whatever humans can do, I agree. It, it's going to be pretty soon that we can get systems that do that. The question is really about how quickly can we adopt it? Mm. How quickly can we put it into production? The scale of these models make adoption difficult, and so a focus for us at Cohere has been about compressing that down, making them more adoptable, more efficient. Um, I think we will have that technology quite soon, but for it to actually you know, diffuse into our environment, our daily lives, the way that we work, that could really take decades. Do you think AGI will be as exciting as people think? I, I think it'll be more exciting. <laughs> more exciting. <laughs> well, the, the other part of this as well a lot of people have been looking at is um, you spoke earlier about independence, you know, not taking these huge checks from some cloud providers, you know, the likes of Amazon or Microsoft, et cetera, uh, et cetera. You know, there's a, there's a view that actually um, with the development of AI and with these large tech behemoths investing in some of these uh, AI companies, that this is just going to serve to cement the power of these large companies who have dominated over sort of the last decade and a half or so. Um, is that a legitimate concern? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm extremely concerned about reduced dynamism in the market. Mm. Uh, these models do require a ton of capital in order to build. And so by default, who are the folks who have capital? The big incumbents. Yeah. And so they have an inherent advantage. They have channel advantages. I, I think all of us want to see a dynamic market where there are new minds, there are new companies, there's new people thinking about what to build and experimenting. And so I, it would be a shame. And so I think it's important for, for regulators, um, as well as those purchasing the technology, to make conscious decisions about let's not cut out a new generation of ideas and people and entities. Mm. There's a big focus on, on the responsible development of, of AI technology, um, you know, how to avoid things like bias and misinformation, et cetera, et cetera. What are you doing at Cohere uh, to, to responsibly develop this technology? Yeah, it's a huge priority. I think we don't want to entrench biases. We want to make sure that our models keep up to date with the moral frameworks and, and belief systems and, and knowledge of humanity as it progresses over time. So we don't release a model that's just a fixed asset in time. It's not frozen in a moment. It's constantly being updated, adjusted with new news, opinions, thoughts. Um, to protect against bias, there's lots of interventions you can make, especially after you've trained it during the pre-training phase. There's this thing called post-training, which we use to refine its behavior, kind of shape the model's personality, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and so we have a lot of control over how it behaves in production by doing that shaping. And so mm. that's, a, that's a huge priority for let's, us. Let's talk a bit about your business then and your business focus for 2024. Um, at Cohere, what is, the, what is the focus here? Is it shipping more product, uh, getting more customers? Just run us through that. Yeah, so I, I think 2023 uh, was the year of the proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Like the technology entered the consumer mind, it became the fastest growing consumer product uh, in history. Yeah. In history, And so every single enterprise realized, wow, consumers love this. It provides a magical experience. Yeah. Uh, what can we do? How can we adopt this? How do we transform our, our product? How do we change the way our employees work? Um, and so that 
that resulted in them spinning up POCs all over the place. Now, that's all transitioning into production. So they've built these POCs, they've been successful, and they're trying to build them into production. There are scaling challenges. It's easy to use a massive model when there's five people using the POC. Yeah. <laughs> when you have 500 million people using it, it's a very different, different game, different right. economics. Uh, and so efficiency, making sure these things are scalable, robust, extremely low error, very reliable. Uh, those are the pressures that come in now that we're actually going to hit production. Yeah. Like these are actually going to become parts of our day to day. Okay. So you're going to start businesses are going to begin to use your, your products this year. Yeah, they already are. They already are. Uh, and so, yeah, we're going live with a bunch of different applications in the first quarter of this year mm -hmm. uh, alongside a whole host of our partners. And, and given the excitement around LLMs, around AI right now, you raised a ton of money last year to continue that growth. Are you expecting to raise some more this year? Uh, you know, startups are always <laughs> raising. And, and I'm, in a, I'm in a very capital intensive game, so yeah. I, I sure hope so. Yeah. And then we've got about a minute left, so I just wanted to get your view on what is beyond LLMs in the AI, what comes next? I've been speaking to people this week about things like robotics, about synthetic data, about AI simulation, some of these areas that they feel are sort of new frontiers beyond LLMs, uh, or that LLMs can enable. Uh, what do you see as some of the sort of nearer term promising uh, aspects of the technology? I think something big is gonna happen in robotics. Right. Um, the large language models are, they're exiting the phase where they're only interacting through language. Mm -hmm. Currently it's like text in, like you write some text in, it writes some text out. That's starting to change. Now there's images in, now there's images out, audio in, audio out, video. Mm. Uh, and so this is unlocking the power of large language models for much more visual spatial domains. And mm -hmm. so robotics is ripe for something immense. Like humanoid robots? <laughs> I mean, maybe, but any type, of, I don't care what type of robot. <laughs> but yeah, just really smart robots that know how to do really complex things. Uh, I think I think we'll start to see that. Yeah. Fantastic, Aiden. Thank you so much for your insight into all that and and into the future. Very excited to see what you're up to this year at Cohere. That was Aiden Gomez, the CEO, co-founder of uh, Cohere. Round of applause.